Apostolic letter Totum Amoris Est of Pope Francis and St. Francis the Sal following. The Ecstasy of Life St. Francis thus came to view the entirety of the Christian life as the ecstasy of work and life. For him, Christianity was not to be confused with a facile escapism or self-absorption, much less a dull and dreary obedience. We know that this danger can always be present in the, light, in the life of faith. Indeed, there are Christians whose lives seem like Lent without Easter. And while we can understand the grief of people who have to endure great sufferings, slowly but surely we all have to let the joy of faith begin to revive as a quiet yet firm trust, even amid the greatest distress. Allowing joy to blossom in our hearts is what Francis de Sales means by ecstasy of work and life. In this way, we live not only a civil, a civil, honest and Christian life, but a superhuman, spiritual, devout and ecstatic life, a life that in any case is beyond and above our natural condition. Here we arrive at the central luminous pages of the treatise, where that ecstasy is presented as the joyous exuberance of a Christian life that transcends the mediocrity of mere conformity. Not to steal, lie or swear in vain, to love and honor one's, one's father, not to kill, this is to live in accord with natural reason. But to forsake all our goods to love poverty, to call her and consider her a most delightful mistress, to consider reproach, persecution and martyrdom as happiness and blessing, to preserve absolute chastity, to live in the world contrary to all the wisdom of the world and against the tide of this life by habitual resignation, renunciation and acts of self-abnegation, this is not to live in ourselves, but above and beyond ourselves. And because no one can go out of and above himself in this manner, unless the Eternal Father draw him, it follows that the kind of life is a perpetual rapture and a continual ecstasy of action and operation. A life, in other words, that rediscovers the wellsprings of joy and avoids the temptation of self-centeredness. For the great danger in today's world, pervaded as it is by consumerism, is the desolation and anguish born of a complacent yet covetous heart, the feverish pursuit of frivolous pleasures and a blunted conscience. Whenever our interior life becomes caught up in its own interests and concerns, there is no longer room for others, no place for the poor. God's voice is no longer heard, the quiet joy of his love is no longer felt, and the desire to do good fades. This is a very real danger for believers too. Many fall prey to it and end up resentful, angry, and listless. To this description of the ecstasy of work and life, St. Francis adds two important clarifications that remain valid for us today. The first offers a practical criterion for discerning the authenticity of this style of life, while the second concerns its deepest source. As the criterion of discernment, he states that while, on the one hand, this ecstasy entails genuine self-renunciation, on the other, it does not mean fleeing from life. 
We should constantly remind ourselves to this, lest we risk straying from the right path. In a word, those who think they are rising to God, yet fail to love their neighbor, are deceiving both themselves and others. Here we find the same criterion that Francis used to measure devotion. If you see a person who in prayer has raptures that exalt him above himself to God and yet has no ecstasy of life, that is, he does not lead a life elevated and joined to God above all by means of constant charity. Believe me, Theotimus, all his raptures are exceedingly dubious and dangerous. His conclusion is incisive. Being above ourselves in prayer, but beneath ourselves in life and action. Being angelic in meditation, but brutish in conversation, is a true sign that such raptures and ecstasies are nothing other than diversions and deceits of the evil spirit. In essence, this is what Paul already pointed out to the Corinthians in his hymn to charity. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have no love, I am nothing. If I give way, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burnt, but do, do not have love, I gain nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2 and 3. For St. Francis de Sales, then, while the Christian life is never without ecstasy, ecstasy is inauthentic apart from a truly Christian life. Indeed, life without ecstasy risks being reduced to blind obedience, a gospel bereft of joy. On the other hand, ecstasy without life easily falls prey to the illusions and deceptions of the evil one. The great polarities of the Christian life can be resolved and eliminated. If, if anything, each preserves the authenticity of the other. Truth, then, does not exist without justice, pleasure without responsibility, spontaneity without law, and vice versa. As for the deepest source of this ecstasy, St. Francis astutely traces it to the love made manifest by the incarnate Son. If indeed love is the first act and principle of our devout or spiritual life, through which we live, feel and are moved, and the spiritual life is such as our affective movements are, then it becomes clear that a heart without affection has no love, and that a heart that has love is not without affection. The source of this love that attracts the heart is the life of Jesus Christ. Nothing sways the human heart as much as love, and this is most evident in the fact that Jesus Christ died for us, he gave us life through his death. We live only because he died and died for us as ours and in us. These words are profoundly moving. They reveal not only a clear and insightful understanding of the relationship between God and humanity, but also the deep bond of affection between Francis de Sales and the Lord Jesus. The ecstasy of life and action is no abstract reality, but shines forth in the charity of Christ that culminates on the cross. That love, far from mortifying our existence, makes it radiate with extraordinary brightness. 
For this reason, St. Francis de Sales could eloquently describe Calvary as the mountain of lovers. For there, and there alone, do we come to realize that it is not possible to have life without love, or love without the, the death of the Redeemer. Except there everything is either eternal death or eternal love, and the whole of Christian wisdom consists in knowing how to choose well between them. Francis could thus conclude his treatise by appealing to a sermon of St. Augustine on charity, quote, What is more steadfast than charity? Not in requiting injuries, but in taking no account of them, concerned not with passing things, but with eternity, since it has an unshakable trust in the promises of the future life, charity can tolerate all things in this present life. It can endure whatever it must hear below, because it hopes in the promises of the world to come. Truly, charity never fails. Cultivate it then, and thinking holy thoughts bring forth fruits of justice. And if you should discover anything else in praise of charity beyond what I have said here, let it become evident in your life. All this was supremely evident in the life of the saintly bishop of Annecy, and now once more it is entrusted to each of us. May the celebration of the fourth centenary of his death help us to venerate St. Francis de Sales with devotion, and through his intercession, may the Lord bestow the abandoned gifts of the Spirit upon the journey of his holy and faithful people. End of this letter. May God bless us all.